It's a hot one in Sandwich Village today, weather-wise, but the house detectives are turning up the heat on one of the most visible eyesores in this village. That's next on The House Detectives. How many times have you driven through this town of Sandwich and seen these homes that are just in total disrepair? They're falling apart. Well, I'm sure you've asked those questions, who owns it? Who's behind this? What are the decisions that have led to this home being in such disrepair? Well, the house detectives, we're on it. We're going to talk about that. There are numerous homes in Sandwich that really do need that level of attention and many of them are within the historic district or they are historic homes themselves. Today, we're gonna to tell you about one structure. It's right behind us here, the historic boathouse on Grove Street, sitting right behind Town Hall. Here's what you're gonna learn in today's program. What is the history behind this structure or the land, I should say, and or the land behind it? And what do we know about its current ownership and why based on our research, is it in such disrepair? A little later in the discussion, we're gonna have a conversation with Lisa Hassler, who is the chair of the Sandwich Historical Commission, and she's gonna bring the discussion a little bit to a higher level and talk to us a little bit more about uh, demolition by delay and demolition by neglect. And what is the Historic Commission, Historical Commission and the Historic District Committee uh, aware of and what are some of those issues on that level? Let me first introduce you to my co-host of this program, Amanda Haynes. Amanda is an attorney, a realtor, a member of the Sandwich Historical Commission. She is a resident of Sandwich, and oh, by the way, you live on Grove Street. Um, so I'm glad you're here. Thank you Thank very you, much. Greg. Thank you. So Amanda, you have um, you are truly the detective in this in this uh, venture here. And, and this is really one of many programs that we're gonna be doing. This is, we're not just picking on the boathouse. Uh, but you have spent a tremendous amount of time on your own doing some research. Uh, tell us a little bit about the history of this structure and the land on which it sits. Well, Greg, to understand the boathouse, uh, which was built in 1902, we need to actually go back 200 years to 1700. And if you and I were able to time travel and we're sitting here in 1700 and looked behind us, what we would have seen was a beautiful colonial house that stretched all the way from Grove Street to the shore of the pond and then back in an L. Um, and that house was very significant because it was the ancestral home of Nathaniel Freeman. Now, if you've walked down Grove Street at all, I'm sure you've noticed there's these huge granite boulders around the boathouse and that's not because that's just a rocky piece of land it's right. because that's the actual foundation of the nathaniel freeman house and we have some wonderful pictures from the 1880s which show that house in existence um, the reason why it's significant is because nathaniel freeman uh, at that time was probably sandwich's most important patriot and um, he was quite an attractive man. He was very charismatic. Uh, he was an attorney, a judge, a medical doctor, a brigadier general. And we can certainly imagine him striding out that front door in his beautiful blue and buff uniform, mounting his, his horse and going off to fight liberty, for fight for liberty. Um, he was a contemporary of George Washington. They corresponded. And in his free time, he married twice and had 20 children. What? Yes. So, uh, Wait, so, so, so right over there, 20 children yes, were conceived? Yes. Uh, he That's lived, wild. He lived in the house until 1827 when he died. So okay. he lived there for 62 years. And then it went to his son, who was another character, which we, we don't have time for, for his stories. But he died in 1883. And at that time, the house was in disrepair. And by 1895, it was being torn down. Can you give me a sense of, of the size of the house? I mean, not square footage, but are we talking about a home that would be um, the equivalent to some of the, the larger structures that we would see on Main Street, for example? It was a, a pretty substantial house, uh, very comparable to the other houses on Grove Street across the street from it. Um, you can imagine with all those children, he needed a lot of rooms. Uh, so when the house went down in 1895, 
there was a lot of sadness about it, and that's really one of the first instances of demolition by neglect that, that I can think of. Wow. It was reported in the paper, and uh, they were hopeful that pieces of the house would go on and be reincorporated into other homes, you know, bricks and, and timber. So who knows how many pieces of sandwich houses these days have some yeah. of Nathaniel Freeman in them. Wow. So the house comes down. Yes. It was a, a sad day in Sandwich way back when. How did we get into the boat boathouse so structure? So the, the Wessons pick up the story in about 1880 when James Wesson built his beautiful Victorian summer home called Fairview. Now, he was considered a summer resident, but he was actually a member of the Toby and Nye families, so everyone in Sandwich knows about them. Sure. You know, extensive roots here in Sandwich. But he built the, eight, uh, the boathouse in 1902, and uh, at that time it was known as the Wesson Boathouse. Uh, and I just want to tell you, uh, this isn't just sort of a place to keep kayaks. This was a little mini palace that sat on the, the shore of the pond. And in the grand opening of it, it was reported that he and his family, his daughters, all their friends, sat there in Victorian splendor wow. and enjoyed uh, this thing called the Venetian Boat Carnival, which uh, again, so now we're at 1902, and if we looked behind us, you yeah. can imagine sort of this flotilla of barges and boats with Japanese lanterns, with thousands of people here clapping and cheering. Um, and they sat in luxury. There's a piano in there. There's, it's all wood paneled. And they were just enjoying you know, sort of this, this really just fantastic Victorian celebration. Wonderful. And the Wessons brought that yes. to fruition. What happened next? Well, um, we have some postcards that date from that period so that you can see that around this time, there's a lot of boathouses on the pond. And there was two of them directly behind us. Um, so when you look at uh, contemporaneous pictures, you need to be sure that you're seeing this boathouse and not others. Mm -hmm. But this is the last one left. And how we get to that story is, is rather sad. So the Popes, who still live on Grove Street, their house is still on Grove Street, another name that resonates with us sure. in Sandwich. Of course. Uh, they took it over in 1957. They had it for 40 years. And then in 1997, Alice Pope, who owned it, ran into some tax problems. Shocking and sandwich. Uh, so <laughs> right. she decided to sell it. And the first people she tried to sell it to wanted to turn it into an environmental design studio. I have no idea what that is. Wow. But the neighbors were not happy with that idea. Sure, yeah. Um, so they objected. They went to the Zoning Board of Appeals. The idea was shot down, which does show that when people rally around, you know, sort of a cause, yeah. they, they do have influence on the Zoning Board of Appeals, and the whole idea uh, came to a standstill. Hmm. Enter Ronald Cronin. Okay. Ronald Cronin, um, and you were featured on the front of the um, Sandwich Enterprise recently um, talking about this boathouse and talking about your involvement. Now now it gets a little bit more personal based on, on your, your involvement and others yes. um, in, in the area. But um, bring us the Ronald Cronin story to as, as you know it. So in 1997, Mr. Cronin bought the boathouse for $33,000. Um, and now you see the result uh, in 2018. Do we know what condition it was in when he acquired it? I'm not going to lie. It wasn't in great condition. We have some photos from the 70s that show it was already deteriorating. But certainly in the last couple of years with the storms and the bad weather and the tarp on it, it it's really reached a crisis situation. Um, myself and other neighbors and the Historic District Committee have all tried to approach Mr. Cronin with any thought of restoring it or buying it, and he is universally uh, uninterested to any offers to even fix it for free. Um, the only known position he's taken is that for $150,000 or $175,000, he's willing to sell it. But since it's assessed at $17,000, that 
probably isn't very realistic. Because the, the land is skinny. Yes. And it stretches along Grove Street. So even building a home would be tough. Not possible. Not possible, no. even because it's on the water and, and, yes. and the, 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 the size of the, the property. We're thinking maybe a quarter of an acre tops. Yes. Um, so we're really at, at a place where it is a um, historic piece of land, a historic structure, by all definitions, uh, that's in total disrepair and the property owner wants nothing to do with entertaining any options aside from maybe selling it for what others have deemed to be more than it's worth. Right, and we're here because we're house detectives, but that's a mystery that I cannot solve. Right, and and we're not in a position to condemn anybody. Um, in fact, a lot of the homes that we're going to talk about on House Detectives will be um, some good stories. You know, they're not all bad stories. They're not all about just walking away. Uh, but this is a troublesome one. You live on Grove Street. You are next door to it. Um, can you give me a sense of what the uh, tenor is amongst your neighbors? Well, I don't want people to assume that it's only an issue for me because I'm on the street. I think that if you look at the amount of money that the town has spent, we have spent as townspeople, on restoring the grist mill, the town hall, the town cemetery. This is just another jewel in the crown of our really significant, important historic resources. And to let this one go, as I said, it's the last boathouse we have left. We'll never be able to replace it. Yeah. And it does stand as a marker for a history that stretches from 1700 till today. Yeah. Yeah. Your research is phenomenal. And frankly, I am blown away that you just <laughs> threw all that out without any notes. I'm a notes guy. I need notes. Um, so let's bring in Lisa Hassler. Um, Lisa is the um, chair of the Sandwich Historical Commission. I am the vice chair by full disclosure. So Lisa and I have, have worked together. Um, Lisa, as you hear this discussion and you, you're listening to the, the, the research, I know a little bit about you that you're probably listening with great interest yeah, in I terms of say, all of this. I'm blown away too. <laughs> yeah. What, I what? had no idea that the history went back that far. So kudos to you for digging well, up all that you. research. That's very, amazing. It's very cool. Yeah. yeah. So, so Lisa, it, it give, can you give me a definition, um, loose definition? I'm not asking for legal or anything in black and white, but tell me what demolition by neglect is to your understanding. So demo by neglect, uh, the, a bylaw that deals with demo by delects, neglect seeks to protect properties from somebody purchasing them and then intentionally leaving them to rot so that they can be torn down. So it's a way to skirt any type of protection that might be on a historic property and go around current ordinances in order to do a demolition. So when somebody owns a structure and uh, says, you know what, I don't want to nor or maybe I can't, um, rebuild it one way to just have it fall apart and just not be an issue anymore is to just let it rot. Um, is there anything, um, when we talk about the boathouse, is there anything that is protecting that boathouse as we sit here today? It's in the, it's in the historic district. It is a historic structure. Right. It's in the old Kings Highway historic district as a contributing member. It's also in Town Hall Square. National Register Historic District and it is a contributing member and if anyone is interested to find out whether you are or aren't a contributing member you just have to go to Macris and you look up your property by the address and then you can see which districts you're in and then if you click on that district at the end of that description of the historic district it will have a list like a, a big graph and it will show which ones are contributing members. So is there a difference, and we talk about this in the context of the wing school, um, there, are, there can be a debate as to whether or not a structure is historic or not. And the distinction of it being a contributing member or a member, um, does that matter when you, from your perspective, are looking at a, um, a structure? 
It, it does matter. Um, if you are a contributing member to a National Register Historic District, it's just like being individually listed. The difference is, if you're individually listed, it's more common that you're outside of a historic district. Okay. So you, it would call out a property either because of its architectural significance or maybe its history. But if it's part of a historic district, there's some commonality among the, the homes and buildings that are in that historic district. So rather than call out each one on an individual basis, they're contributing members. But you can have a 1970s building that is not particularly historical, at least not now, right. um, and that can be in a historic district. So that's the case here. Uh, there's many homes you know, in, in the town hall square that are not contributing members. Um, but if you are a contributing member, it, it is an extra um, level of protection. And it's not protection from, it's not protection from the government, all right? So when I, I guess from the federal government level. Sure. So a lot of yeah. people think if you're on the National Register, if you're a contributing member or if you're individually listed, that somehow that means you can't make any changes to the building or that the interiors are protected, and that's just not the case. It's more of an honor. It, it's kind of like a hooray, a you know. This, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, this building is on the National Register. It's a way for people to look up if you're traveling and you're into history. You can look up on the National Register and see which homes are are on it, and you know maybe do a walking tour. We have lots of tourism yeah. here that that does that. Um, so. That's, so, that's the difference. So in Sandwich, from your perspective, are we doing enough? You know, here is an argument being made that this is a structure that has historic significance and based on one property owner's um, decisions, it's fallen into the water. It's, it's, it's a problem. It's an eyesore um, in one of the most visible parts of our lovely community. Um, are we doing enough? to address the demo by neglect issue, in your no, opinion? No, I don't think so at all, and I'll tell you why. There's, there's this little um, kind of gray zone where homes are not protected. So where we do have protection is through the Historic District Committee, so the Old Kings Highway Historic District Committee. Right. If somebody wants to tear down a home or make exterior changes, they would have to put their application through the HDC if they're in the Historic District, and then there is some oversight as to what can be done. But if you are not going before the Historic District Committee, if you're just leaving the house to rot, let's say you leave the windows open or you poke a hole in the roof and you just leave it that way, um, it doesn't take very long in this, uh, this climate. You know, we have a lot of moisture. Um, yeah, so the sure. sun can cause a lot of damage. Really, in just a few years, you can get to a point where that building has to be taken down because it's, uh, at that point, a public safety issue. Yeah. So what we need to do is stop that process early enough that it is not a public safety issue. How do we do that? Well, the, the one way to do that is by doing a demo, a demo by neglect bylaw. Yeah. So okay. there are some communities that have that, and we're going to start researching that as a part of the Historical Commission to see are there any on the Cape that, that have that, maybe other areas of the country even we can learn from. Um, talk to the Mass Historical Commission and see what their ideas are. I'm sure there are other communities in Massachusetts that have them. But I think what needs to be made clear is that the purpose of that is not to punish someone who's living in the house and maybe can't afford to paint their trim or right. even put a new roof on, you know? It's, it's not, that's not the focus so of it. we have an aging population in this town, so we, it, generally speaking, we have people that are in their 80s, limited income, paying a ton of taxes, trying to manage their home, and it is falling down around them. We're not talking about um, that profile person. We're talking about somebody or a property owner who is just kind of letting it sit and saying, hey, you know what, it's my right. Right, so an abandoned building would be an example of that. Right. So no one's living in the building, but it's being left to rot. So there are some remedies that could happen if you have one of these ordinances. The town could um, issue fines for you know, allowing, let's say, a hole in the roof or that type of thing, or right. you know, the windows to be open all winter. 
Um, but they could also take the next step and actually contract to have work done to stabilize, you know, the minimum amount just to stabilize that property and prevent it from slipping into further uh, disrepair. Right. And then there would be a special assessment to the owner and they would be responsible for paying that special assessment so that the town would recoup um, their investment. So from, from your perspective, here we are, we're, we're embarking on, a, on an awesome series that, um, that we're doing with Sandwich Community Television to really shed some light on these homes. And we have a long list, <laughs> a long list. Your research has just begun, but you've been doing amazing work. Let's talk a little bit about where we are as a community. We're all taxpayers, we all live here. Um, Talk about the scale, if you will, from either of your perspectives as to how much of an issue this really is in terms of these structures. I made reference that there are numerous, but I didn't throw a number on that. I'm not asking you to put a number, but how big of an issue is this to have uh, that we have these structures around town? Well, I think it's a huge issue. Uh, the, the history once lost is gone forever, you know, and if you care anything about history, and I think that the like you said, the town folk have shown their commitment to the history of this town and to preservation in general, and we've enjoyed incredible support of our historic resources. Mm -hmm. So I think it is a very important item, but the problem is if it's, if it's privately owned, we don't have that leverage right. to help protect the building, and the building has no one to speak for it but the, the town people who care and the historical commission. So Amanda, to the point of it's my property, you know, I, I, I can't, uh, you know, there are zoning uh, rules that say I can't um, make my home uh, a mechanic, uh, you know, shop. I, I can't make it a restaurant. It's, there are zoning uh, areas, but you know what? If I want a piece of structure on my house to just fall apart, it's my house, my home, my land. What do you say to people that say that? Well, I think that is one perspective that if it's private property, uh, but there's a lot of ways we regulate people's private properties. If I wanted to put a neon sign in my backyard that said, you know, no geese allowed and have it light up the pond, I couldn't do that. Yeah. Uh, and I think... Uh, well, well, very funny. <laughs> and I have an image in my head as to what yes, that would and, look like. And I don't... That's an issue that I have yeah. <laughs> with geese, right, but uh, geese. Uh, they can't read, so that wouldn't help the situation. True, but um, true. <laughs> no, I think when somebody buys a historic home, they kind of shoulder that responsibility because these homes have stood for hundreds of years and we're taking them down in 20. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's not about us. It's about future generations. And, and Sandwich, we pride ourselves on our history here. Yeah, yeah, we, we sure do. Um, any other comments, Lisa, you know, from, from the historic, you know, there's the historic district committee, uh, and then there is the historical commission, which oftentimes people blend the same and they say, oh, you're the one that does this or that. Um, can you, can you t just give me some final thoughts as to what your understanding is, and you can't speak for Bill Collins, who's the chair of the HDC, but what kind of leverage, what kind of um, push are these two groups applying towards situations like this, to your knowledge? Well, we're trying to investigate ways to prevent this. Um, some of that's education, so it's not all through regulation, but maybe education and trying to get homeowners on board. Sometimes they may not even realize how important their house is and what the history is. There may have been changes on the interior that mask the age of the house, and they may not even realize, especially if they're new to the area. So I think education is a big part of it. I think that the HDC's responsibility is much different than the Historical Commission. So in the Historical Commission, our concern is a little broader, and we're concerned with the interior, the exterior, um, mm -hmm. the ground that it sits on, what's in the ground, what's around it. And um, with the Historic District Committee, they're concerned with mainly the facades and uh, the front facade or any part of the building that is facing a public way and how it fits in with its neighboring homes, um, which is a very important duty and certainly that's one big reason why Sandwich looks the way Sandwich does <laughs> yeah, yeah. and the Old Kings Highway looks the way it does. Sure. So, I, But the Historical Commission's duties, I think that ours will branch out more towards um, 
investigating what kinds of uh, solutions have been done in other places and how can we adopt those here and would right. they be Best successful practices. for us exactly right. in addition to the education and also quite honestly I think we're cheerleaders for historic preservation yeah yeah I, I would definitely agree you know um, in the meantime here we are sitting next you know on the property of the Deacon Eldred house and looking across the water at um, a, a structure that is 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 really that eyesore, um, and I and I'm intentionally being dramatic about that. It is an eyesore. Um, any any final thoughts from you guys as to what you would like to see happen across the pond here? Well, um, stabilizing the structure is is really critical. It's probably not going to last another six months, certainly not a year. But, I mean, you can envision all sorts of wonderful uses for it. Uh, a park with picnic tables for the people that work at Town Hall, a, a place to store boats, a place to meditate, uh, just a wonderful green space uh, with the history that goes with it. What do you think? Well, I would love it if um, the owner would, would see fit to maybe partner you know, with somebody or sell the property to somebody who would be able to love it and preserve it. Um, you know, it's hard when, you, when you're talking about private ownership to say, you should sell your house. And right. I, I know that, you know, sometimes it does step over the line, but I do think when you consider the history of this property and the fact that it's almost gone, um, I do think it's a crisis situation. and. I guess my plea would be that I hope that the owner would would step up and say, okay, yeah, let's do what's best for this property yeah. and, and maybe what's best for him too, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I appreciate uh, both of your, your inputs. We will see each other again. Lisa, yes. I'm sure you're gonna be back. Um, <laughs> thank you for watching this episode of The House Detectives, a really cool new program that Sandwich Community Television is putting together for you. Our effort in this series is really to shed light on structures and homes that nobody wants to look at. Uh, what is that story behind it? And hopefully in these episodes, we're gonna give you an opportunity to learn and maybe even feel a sense of um, obligation or connectedness to uh, finding solutions in these situations. We also stated that not every situation in every home that you'll see on this program will be uh, about somebody doing bad things to old, wonderful, historic structures. There are good stories to be told and we'll bring those to you as well. If you have any uh, suggestions, if there is a structure, a house, a building that you would like us to focus on, simply email us. You can email us at housedetective1637 at gmail.com. It's up on your screen right now. So let us know if there's something you'd like us to pursue and we'll be happy to consider that. For Amanda Haynes and Lisa Hassler, I'm Greg Anderson. We'll see you next time. Thanks. That's it. Thank you so much. Do you have a closer? <laughs>